On today's Locked On Thunder podcast, we're joined by Derek Parker to preview the 2024 NBA draft. Who are some top targets at 12? You are Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, media member, and inside the Thunder beat writer, Ryland Styles. Follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. So follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunder Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Derek Parker, the GOAT of Inside the Thunder, co GOAT of Inside the Thunder, the host of his own YouTube channel. Derek Parker on YouTube, where he does tremendous draft content, runs draft digest as well. Derek, how are you doing today? Dude, Kogoat is crazy, first off, but uh, I'm good. All day today, I, I didn't feel locked in. And then, oh, the second I see that intro, the Locked On Thunder, it swipes across my screen. I immediately lock in, so I'm good, man. I I'm ready to rock. I'm glad that you're locked in. You and Nick Crane are Kogoats of both sites, actually. Uh, but Derek... The 2024 NBA draft is a week away. We're a week out of the draft. Are you excited? Like, what's your overall vibe check on this draft? I'm really excited, personally. I know this draft doesn't have a sparkling reputation. It doesn't have, like, the same superstar punch that a lot of it have had before. But to me, it's really wide open. Like, I feel like up to this point, we have a lot of intel. We get a lot of these reports coming out. And to this point, there's been some of that, but there hasn't been as much as normal. It kind of feels like a, a calm before the storm, a late bloom. I don't know what it is, but I'm really excited because it feels like this could go a thousand different directions. Yeah, I, I think that that is where the, this draft has the entry that like, you know, it's not the where are these like future superstars going to land. It's the fact that we just don't know where anyone's going to go. Like if you legitimately um, on Wednesday took Twitter off your phone and took off whatever news breaking apps that you're on, uh, you would be shocked by the results of the draft. Like you, it is incredibly tough to predict. Uh, there is no, you know, oh, the draft doesn't start until pick X. The draft starts at pick one, and uh, there's no consensus that no one really knows what's going on. Now, with that being said, uh, you've covered this entire cycle uh, as a draft expert, and you've seen all the ebbs and flows. Who are some guys that stand out for you in this draft that, like you said, has been uh, punched on a little bit all year long? Yeah, if we're talking like guys I have to rock with, we're going to start with Ron Holland. I have him at number one. You can check out my board on YouTube. Have, num have him at number one. He's one of the best athletes in this draft. High motor on defense with really good instincts. Over three stocks per game in the G League at 18 years old is elite. Don't care who it is. Offense and decision-making obviously need to improve, but it isn't that far off. Again, there's been reports he'll slide out of the lottery, but I don't buy it. If he were there at 12 for Oklahoma City, I'd run to the podium. Uh, another one, Jared McCain, one of the best shooters in this draft, has the ability to handle the rock, elite in the pick and roll, pretty elite modern skill set overall, great passer, really good connective passing, not necessarily flashy stuff, and then not a detriment on defense either. Overall, McCain's just a guy that I think you'll really have a hard time keeping off the floor if he can bomb threes and play mistake-free basketball. But there, there's a myriad of these potential guys here. We're talking about Oklahoma City probably considering at least 20 different people doing their due diligence and, and getting interviews on a lot, a lot of guys. Yeah, the, the Thunder are going to be in contact and uh, check out nearly everybody in the draft because you just have to do your due diligence in that way. Um Looking at the Thunder at, at 12, how do you see the value of this pick? Historically, the Thunder have gotten good value at 12 just as a franchise, and you know, this range has been one that actually you know bears out some, some quality prospects. Where is it in this draft in terms of, like should the Thunder like being at 12? Should they aim to move up or, or move back, or are they kind of right in a sweet spot? Well, it, it's all dependent on who your guy is. If your guy goes at nine, then you're going to want to go up to nine. But I think 12 very generally is a great spot to be in right now because historically we've seen the picks maybe five, even starting at four through eight, nine, 10, 11. Those get overthought a lot and it, it leads to players falling further and further down and you can nab those guys at 12, 13, 14, and so on. In this draft specifically, 
that kind of starts a little bit earlier in the process. Like I touched on earlier, there's not these studs at number one and number two that we absolutely for a fact know are going there right now. We have like a general roadmap for it, but we're not 1000% sure. And so that causes even more mystery, even more overthinking. And I think there's going to be some really, really good players both now and for the long term that fall to this 12 spot. So again, it's a good spot to be in. It'll be exciting to see kind of how this all unfolds. But I would imagine that that we look at this through the lens of the Thunder staying put at 12. Uh, obviously, shuffling up here and there like they did last year for Casey Wallace, you know, that's hard to predict. Um, when you look at number 12 and you combine that with the Thunder's needs, is there anyone who jumps out to you as like the Thunder need this guy uh, to really you know help them? I mean, I think they're playing a little bit with house money here and the fact that you could swing on this pick and if you miss, I don't think it really affects your future a ton. And if you hit, of course, that's great. But I, I think need is just a little bit uh, of an off word. Like th this could be a pick where you take that swing and you really swing for the fences and try to bolster this roster for the future. But there, you've also, like I said, you're, you're playing with house money here and the fact that if you do miss, not a massive deal. Yeah, I, I think that there's two schools of thought with like this draft of um, do you take your swing where you could miss now uh, versus go going and getting a nearly for sure contributor. So like an example, I've been wrestling back and forth with, would you rather just take Jared McCain, Devin Carter, somebody like that this year with the understanding of, uh, while it is a unique position to be a 57-win team and having a lottery pick. The Thunder have set themselves up to have this unique position unfold for them uh, in the future and, and like many times in the future, including next year. Uh, so like next year, uh, they get a lottery pick, for example. That's a much deeper, more talented draft class that like maybe the swing next year uh, is still a risk and you could still miss, but you have less of a likelihood to strike out versus like right now, uh, if you if you take a, a high upside swing there's a chance you just completely fail. And like, there's not even hope for the player. Whereas next year that the prospects are so much better and talented that you take that swing, you might still hit a single, even though you didn't get a home run. So balancing like when to take the swing versus when to take the surefire pick, uh, whenever you're looking at the need for cost controlled talent for a team that's going to get expensive with their young core pretty soon. Yeah, I think there's obviously like the two schools of thought in win now versus project, and that very much exists within the draft space, but I'm not necessarily sure it changes the Thunder's process. They probably have their board, and whether he's going to need two years to develop or no time at all to develop, that's probably their BPA, their best guy available. So it probably doesn't change their process a whole lot in the, the short term, but long term, yeah, of course. We'll see kind of how the Thunder want to uh, go about this draft. We're going to talk coming up as we're going to do the winners and losers of the draft and grading the draft and everything else that we do around uh, the NBA draft. What players should the Thunder take that will for sure get a Derek Parker A-plus grade in the draft? Find out coming But first one's here right now, but our good friends over at eBay Motors. Derek, eBay Motors is awesome. Passion, drive, and patience. That's the formula for a winning championship. It's also the formula for keeping your ride-or-die vehicle alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performances with superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered with over 122 million parts to choose from. You're number one ride-or-die. You'll always find exactly what you're looking for. Uh, with eBay Motors Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back because with eBay Motors, you're going to be burning rubber, not cash. And with all the parts to choose from, it'll make your car the MVP and bring home the huge win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Ellis Bottoms only, exclusions apply. eBay Motors Guaranteed Fit, only available for U.S. customers. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast. On the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day, joined by draft expert. Derek Parker, you can find him on Draft Digest, inside the Thunder.com, and his YouTube channel, Derek Parker. Derek, we're going to do winners and losers on multiple sites, probably, uh, from the NBA draft. Who could the Thunder select? Or, or you can list off as many players as you want. Like, what group of players could the Thunder select that they would for sure be etched into your winners category or get an A plus grade for their class? 
Yeah, my head canon has kind of narrowed it down to about three to four guys that I think they're realistically really going to think about. And obviously, like I said earlier, this range could be 20 different people, so I could be fully off base on this. But this is having covered the team and having covered the draft. This would be my assessment. Cody Williams continues to top that list. I think it's a perfect storm in the fact that he's got these obvious Thunder connections in dub. They know his work ethic. They know his circle. And he does fit the mold and fills a position of need on the wing. Fluid, lengthy at six foot nine. He's got baseline skills like good defense. He can shoot at some, has the high level point forward flashes. And most of all, I really think he'll personally be in their range. I'm not sold he'll go higher. There have been reports that the Pistons really like him at five. I think his ceiling is probably around number 10 to the Jazz. I could see the Bulls swinging at 11. So to me, Cody's a legit target. You might have to trade up a couple spots for him, but should be gettable. There's also Deron Holmes, 6'10 big out of Dayton, who He's obviously become a big fan favorite on social media. I really like him, like that pick too. He was one of the best players in college basketball this year per basically every advanced metric. Interior force, really bolstered his perimeter game. Can shoot, pass, dribble in open space. He's a versatile defender. And there's also a ton of connections to be made between Holmes and this Thunder team. Dayton's head coach, Anthony Grant, is a former Thunder assistant coach. Holmes was highly touted out of high school, chose Dayton, Stuck with Dayton despite likely having his pick of where he wanted to go after years one and two in college, especially two. And from what I've heard, he's just a great kid. Seems to have high basketball IQ from interviews that I've watched. Head down kind of worker. So that fit makes sense on a variety of levels. Ultimately, 12 is a little bit high for Holmes. He's on the older side. He's more of that win now veteran-y type player. But in this draft, there's going to be plenty of guy getting and taking a swing on him at 12 likely wouldn't be the craziest thing. Jared McCain, we've already touched on a little bit, but I think his fit with the Thunder is pretty seamless. Ultimate locker room guy, fun, high energy, fills that always needed three-point shooting need, isn't a detriment on defense, and in terms of feel for the game, is probably one of the best plug-and-play system guys in this draft. And then one last name that just, I cannot scratch this itch of the Thunder considering him is Khalil Ware. And I'm not necessarily a Khalil Ware guy, but seven foot Four, he's seven foot with a seven four wingspan, pretty mobile, interior force, good rim protector who could turn into a great one. And he has the ability to extend to the perimeter too. Most simply, he's just a hybrid seven footer who can do a ton of things. The big knock on him is the motor and his competitiveness. There's been reports he's crushing workouts though. Teams are starting to doubt the motor concerns. So if the Thunder can get to a place where they think that's not an issue with where He'll probably jump to the top of this list just in terms of having a player like him as a backup who could toggle between reps with Holmgren, without Holmgren. He's massive. He can do a lot of things. That's that's another guy that I I can't kind of shake. So those are the four, three to four that I would really consider right now to be the main options. Yeah, where would fit into this next category for me of like what you mentioned and like there's more stuff behind the scenes of like it'd be pretty shocking to see the Thunder draft where not for anything on the court, but I could just be pretty shocking uh, because of the competitive motor concerns uh, and, and other things for where. But if they drafted him, that would mean, like you said, that he's passed all of their tests. And if there's any franchise that you trust with the heavy vetting process uh, and to find out how to push your guys' buttons and, and make them competitive and see how they tick, it would be Oklahoma City. Uh, and at that point, to get that signature from Sam on that pick, you'd feel pretty good about what he can bring to the table on the court. So that's an interesting one. Uh, where do you land on some of these other guys that are a bit more polarizing? Let's start with Zach Eady. Uh, he's going to be crammed down uh, your throat for the next week if you're in Oklahoma City because people just look at a lack of size and hit the Zach Eady button. Where are you at on Eady with the Thunder specifically? Regarding the Thunder, I think it's tough because Eady is a obviously polarizing player again seven foot four colossal center one of the best college players we've literally ever seen but he gets a lot of flack for the slower foot speed and things like that and just kind of the general lumbering he's better than people give him credit for 100 he's more skilled on both ends than people give him credit for he's a great play finisher can screen his butt off he's really good and there's a world where he adds the ultimate wrinkle for a team like oklahoma city in being able to throw him out If a big is giving you problems, Edie could be a nullifier on that end. So I don't know that I'm necessarily pro Edie, especially at pick number 12. I think you can get better value, but I'm not against a wrinkle like that. Like 
me and Nick Crane, co-goat, were talking last night, and he brought up a lot of good points in terms of Edie's just a dominant player. Like he's just he's just kind of weird. And sometimes having weird can be a good thing. Yeah, weird is good. I mean, look at you and I on Lockdown Thunder, Derek. But uh another name that is polarizing is Tajan Salon. I believe I said that right, Derek. What do you think, draft expert? Uh, you did say it right. Yeah, Salone, 6'10", bulky, bulky frame, stands to add even more to that, crushing it in the LMB Pro A League for Cholet. He's really, really raw in a lot of areas, and I know you like him, but he struggles to put it on like the floor. you like it raw, Derek. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he struggles to put it on the floor a little bit. The decision-making isn't great. To me, it, it kind of stems from a cognition issue. But he was just so productive due to his motor. And he can hit threes. He can run and dunk. He's massive. He's just a real spark plug in that way. He's almost like the anti Zhang in that his motor and his physicality drive his production rather than that like pure processing, which is not a bad thing for either of them. I'm not like ragging on Usman Zhang. He's great. I think we've seen more than enough in the G League. I think he'll get his fair shot this year. But the like, approach to the game is very different. And I think that can, it can lend itself well for a guy like Salon who projects to be a really good role player. Thank you. I'm so tired of people just like looking at Tijan and being like, Oh, that's just Usman Jang. Like, no, it's not like, it's not Usman Jang. And I, and I cover Usman Jang more than anybody because I go to the blue games and like, I love Usman Jang. Like he's, he's going to be a good player. I believe I, I'm not selling stock of Usman Jang, but they could not be further opposites of each other. Uh, these two prospects. So it is very, very, very um, telling on yourself to compare the two at all. Uh, I, I think that you mentioned uh, what kind of separates him is his motor and his, I think his aggressiveness already at this age to, to have that dog in him, not the gimmicky barking kind, like the actual dog in him where he's going to go get in somebody's grill. He's going to want to take the big shots. He, he wants the basketball. Um, you, you can see him demanding opportunity um, and that's the difference. Like you, you can get mad at PJ Washington and Derek Jones Jr. for having these outlier series in, in Oklahoma city. You know how they had those series. They had the dog in them. They wanted the basketball. They wanted the chance. They wanted the shots. They Dallas had more of those guys than you did. And that's how you create outlier series. The, the Thunder had guys who didn't want the shot and who, who passed it up and who uh, did not want to uh, be in that moment for the most part. Like even their, even their top guys, like J dub was a, was a follower in that series. Uh, you need more guys who are who are willing to be aggressive and then give yourself the chance to have that shot variance. I think that that Tajin does that. Like he's going to take an open three if you leave him open, uh, and and he has the ability to hit them. Spoiler alert for next week. So if you're if you're loyal as you should be, Styles Points reader, um, skip ahead ten seconds. He's on the All Juice team, Derek. He's on the All Juice team. First team All Juice team. Mm. He's on that that Welch's grind, all juice. Oh, he's he's and juice. Let me just he's say, juicy. rightfully so. Again, to, just to throw it back to the kind of ooze so long comparison, you could look at these two guys on paper without watching their game and say, yeah, they're both French. They're both in the same height range. They've both got the long wingspan. They they even do some of this some similar things. They can both run and dunk. They can both hit threes. I, I implore anyone who thinks that to go watch Salone. And if you've seen Jing and you watch Salone. You will quickly realize that the, I don't quite know how to phrase it, but the drive on Salone's end is, is just so much more. You know, he's dunking and yelling and screaming and hyping his teammates up and he's energetic and he's, and that doesn't always lend itself to success. I will say like, sometimes that leads to bad decision-making, bad shot taking, things like that, but he has the drive and to quote a, a ball knower, he has the juice. He does have the juice. Derek. Uh, this question deserves a lot of caveats. And who I, I'm going to ask the question and give the caveats. Who would you be just shocked if the Thunder drafted at 12? Surprised that they're the selection at 12. Now, surprise like, doesn't have to be a bad thing. So, so whenever we say our names, those of you listening, don't just think that we think that that's a bad pick. It's just a pick that we would be shocked if the Thunder made it as, you know, they're, as covering this team very closely. Uh, and again, at 12, not to say if they end up with this prospect later in the draft or at a future at a future you know time, uh, it'd be much different. But specifically, they turn the draft card in at pick number 12, no moves up or down. And this is the prospect. 
who are some realistic names there that you'd be surprised at? Yeah, on the like jaw dropping scale, I think hearing Edie's name at twelve would would like probably do it. Like that's probably as high as it gets. And it's not because I can't see the vision. I, I can. I think he'll be a good NBA player for a long time. But that would, I mean, that would be shocking, right? Like he's one of the most polarizing players we've seen. I wouldn't say the Thunder necessarily are magnets towards those type of players. So that would be shocking. Another name who kind of comes up is Rob Dillingham. There's these reports that he's now working out for Miami, Philadelphia, teams like that, that he could slide out of the lottery. He, on a lot of people's boards, mine included, I have him number three. He would be the best player available at 12. I'd be shocked if Oklahoma City swung on him. He's 6'1", needs the ball in his hands a lot of the time, isn't good defensively, probably the worst defensive prospect in the top 15, 20, maybe even further. Wingspan's only at 6'3". He's another one I, I would be pretty shocked to see on the Thunder's board. Yeah, I, I like all those. And another way to describe this would be like guys that make you go, hmm, like, hmm, they really they really did it. They really drafted this player um, at 12. Uh, along with Edie, like I'd be shocked at Edie. I'd be shocked at, at Khalil Ware at 12 again for other reasons. Um, with those two guys, I'd also be pretty shocked if they took Jacoby Walter, who like is getting some late buzz around this range. I, I just, I'd be shocked in a in a very furious way if they took Jacoby Walter. What do you think of his game? Yeah, I, I liked him for a lot of the year. I still like him. I think I would be a little shocked if they took him at 12. I, it's so weird because some of the things he does is exactly what the Thunder needs. He projects to be a great shot maker. He's got like a plus four or five wingspan. Sometimes the defense looks great. He's really good at slashing. He's great at drawing fouls, gets to the line like four or five times a game, which is great. He was one of the better players as a freshman on one of the best teams in college basketball. He does a lot of things well, but the things that he doesn't do so well, passing and playmaking, defense in general, those are the things that the Thunder look for. So he's green lit in a lot of areas, but he's also kind of a no go in a few areas. So I, I can see it. Like if you're talking about this pick as like a backfill to role players for the next three to four years. That makes sense because maybe you lose some of these off the bench shooters and you plug Walter in, in a few years, that makes sense. But some of those things I just can't quite get around, even though on paper it, it makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. And we'll, we'll talk more about thundery guys. Plus the value of this draft moving up and down coming up. We're back talking about our good friends over at FanDuel. Check them out today. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Go there right now because new customers get $200 in bonus bets with the winning of any $5 bet. That's 200 bucks in bonus bets with the winning of any $5 bet at FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel.com slash locked on to win big on your bucket list. Now, the NBA Finals is over, but if you only want to bet on the NBA, you can still do so at FanDuel. Here's how. You can bet on next year's NBA champion, where the Thunder have top five odds. You can bet on next year's MVP award, where SGA has top four odds. You can bet on the NBA draft, who will be the number one overall pick. Right now, the odds say Zachary Richache. What a, what a surprise that would be. Who would be Bronny James's next team? The Thunder have odds on that as well, plus 3,500. Check it out today at fandle.com slash lockdown. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball with Derek Parker. Derek Parker on YouTube. You can find him at Draft Digest and SI Thunder. Derek, it, when you look at this draft, Correct me if I'm wrong. I defer to you as the expert. Usually we can pick out like, this is a Sam Presti guy. Like this is a guy Sam Presti would absolutely fall in love with. And in this draft, like we've mentioned some names that we like. There's like, yeah, you know, Sam would like that guy. The, th the Thunder would be in on that guy. But they all have a certain drawback that would like give you pause or hesitation to, 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 write that pick in Sharpie. Like for as much credit as the Thunder get for being this tight lipped cards close to the vest organization, the, the players that they've targeted, like you've been able to, to pick it out of the lineup pretty quickly. Um, you know, whenever you're looking at the draft, especially a week out, do you see anyone that, that we're missing of like a guy that you think you could, uh, 
maybe not Sharpie in as the name, but but you'd write it in pen, erasable pen. <laughs> yeah, to your point, there's a lot of guys that that are in that range that we could like theoretically envision with the Thunder, but every single one of them this year, and honestly, this is true for years past, but everyone this year has those one or two things, just like Walter, that could hinder you a little bit. Just they they don't let you grab the Sharpie. They they let you grab the erasable one. So to kind of rebuttal my earlier points, Cody Williams, he's a guy who checks a lot of boxes, but kind of suffers from the same Zhang thing in that he's very thinly framed. Sometimes he's not as aggressive. The flashes are just that. They're not very consistent. Deron Holmes, I don't think the Thunder have ever drafted anyone as old as him in the lottery. Jared McCain, love a lot about him, but he's 6'3", doesn't really have a plus wingspan either. Khalil Ware, we obviously talked about his issues, so... I think we're running the gamut. Like I said, there's 20 different guys. We could talk about them all. They all do some things thundery, some things not. But there's no one this year to me that is just the absolute box checker. Are you with me on Devin Carter Island? In a general sense or for the Thunder? Yes. <laughs> I like Devin Carter a lot. I, I ended up giving him a lottery grade. I think he's going to be a really good NBA player. Uh, you know, 6'3", he's got the plus six wingspan, one of the best defenders in this draft, very obviously, gets after it. He's got all the intangibles. He scores it well. He can shoot it at a high level. Did a ton of stuff, just in general, on offense. Great player, great player. But the things that hold me back from him on the Thunder specifically are just how frenetic and fast-paced. He's a fireball. And again, earlier, to Salon's point, like, that's great a lot of the time, but sometimes it's not. And that rears its head with Devin Carter in the decision-making, the shot diet, things like that. So the Thunder are a team that want to play really clean basketball. Like they don't want to have a high number of turnovers. They don't want to take bad shots. And there's a chance you draft Devin Carter and you plug him in and that erases because he's around all of these good decision-makers and good passes and things. There's also a chance you plug him in and that doesn't necessarily get better. And he a little bit sticks out like a sore thumb. So again, he's a guy that I could fully see them taking. Wouldn't be surprised in the least, but there's also just a few things that don't make him as thundery to me. So I want to break this into a couple categories. I'm going to give you a couple of names that are rising in draft position. And like, do you believe that they could be in the thunders range as reported? And then a couple of guys who are sliding um, as in, like, should the Thunder be a team that takes them if they do have an actual uh, draft night slide? So uh, the couple guys that are rising, uh, Keyshawn George from Miami and Bob Carrington from Pittsburgh. Uh, what are your thoughts on both, especially with how they would fit with the Thunder? Yeah, Keyshawn George is really interesting. He's a guy who I've kind of had pegged as a Thunder guy for a long time. I don't think he's necessarily in the 12 range. I don't no, if I buy that he's rising, I buy that there's maybe a couple teams in the late teens or early 20s that like him. I don't buy an astronomical rise necessarily, but he is thundery in that he can do a little bit of everything at 6'9". He was a guard who had a massive growth spurt, can hit threes at a high volume, can really function on either end of a pick and roll, good on defense generally. So he, I get more than a lot of players. He would probably be in a top 10, top 12 of Thunder guys that I made. Bub. Bub's hard. He, he's tough. He can do so much stuff on offense that others can't. He's big. He had a two to one assist to turnover ratio. Phenomenal in the mid range, like next level in the mid range. But there's so much that he has to work on in terms of pure impact to be able to get to a workable area. He's really, really going to have to land with the right developmental fit. And I'm not sure the Thunder are that team. So when you're looking at sliders, Sliders so far, like there's been the Rob Dillingham one we've kind of dismissed already, but Ron Holland is like a guy that might be sliding and Nikola Topic is a guy that might be sliding for different reasons. Uh, let's save Holland and first go to Topic. Like what do you make of his slide due to injury? And like, would, would he be a, a player worth investing in with the understanding of like, this guy's probably going to miss the entire year. Yeah. I I've had Topic as a top, five to six grade all year. I think he's phenomenal. I get the slide. I do because the knee injury, two knee injuries at 18 years old is not great. And the big thing for me, he had a reported seven foot wingspan, which 
doesn't necessarily translate to stardom, but if you look at the wingspan of a lot of the best drivers and slashers and rim finishers in the league, they all have that really plus wingspan. Shea's a great example of that. And Topich was reported to have a seven foot wingspan and it ended up negative at six, five, which is like a seven inch swing. And obviously for his play style, which is a on ball point guard, really, really high cerebral, high IQ passer. But the only way he really truly gets consistent offense right now is slashing. That's a big hit. I will say if he's there at 12, I mean, I think you have to consider it. He's a player. Like I mentioned McCain earlier in terms of the X's and O's in terms of play style. He'd be really, really easy to plug and play with this Thunder system. Defense, not there yet. Shooting, not there yet. But he's a player who I really genuinely believe could end up a top three player in this class. So if he's there at 12, you've got a little time. Like it's it's not life or death where you would need to rush him out the year after and he immediately has to make an impact. We're talking about this pick, again, as a potential backfill for role players in the future whenever you got to get these contracts up and things like that. So... Topic to me does make sense at pick 12. I think I have him six on my board, so I would swing hard and, and swing fast on Topic. Hard and fast, just the way we do it, DP. Uh, you and I both have Ron Holland, number one. Mm. I was very, very validated whenever I saw that you had Holland one as well. Uh, it's been tough for me to go back and forth between him and Sar, but uh, nonetheless... I don't see a pathway for Ron Holland to fail as a basketball player in the NBA, which in a draft class with no star power and like perceived to be no generational talent, no, you know, star littered, you know, class, it's really tough to pass up on. But for some reason, there's reports that he's sliding. And I think that these reports will end up wrong on Wednesday. Um, but should he slide to the 10 through 12 range where it's like way more realistic to go up and get him? How excited would you be? if the Thunder drafted Ron Holland? And how excited should the listener be if the Thunder landed both of our number one guys? Yeah, I've had Ron Holland number one since the preseason. I watched his G League Ignite season, which again, yeah, 100% had ups and downs. I watched that though, evaluated that, and I still have him number one despite players like Alex Saar rising, Zachary Rizache rising. I think he's a complete stud. To your point, I don't see a world where he's not at the least an NBA contributor in He's got the high motor, phenomenal defense. Again, three stocks per game. I think it was two and a half steals and 0.8 blocks per game at 18 years old in a professional league is elite. And it's not always the cleanest thing you've ever seen, but the motor's high. He's snappy in his movements. The defense is phenomenal. I don't see him not succeeding on that end of the court. And then the offense, again, throwing it back to co-goat Nikki Crane last night to his point, he said that people say the offense is bad, and that's not true. The shooting is bad. The rest of the offense is great. He's great in transition. He's great slashing. Of course, he could stand to get a little more efficient everywhere, but the shooting is the real issue. And the shooting, to me, isn't that big an issue. With the exhibition games, he shot 27% on three attempts. That's pretty much fine, factoring in the fact it was an NBA three-point line, NBA ball. His shot diet was pretty tough in general. He didn't have a point guard setting him up. I think Ron Holland's phenomenal. Again, I've had him at number one all year. I haven't even really got to consider his fit with the Thunder because I thought there was no way he, he'd even be there as well. I thought there was no chance. So this is, I mean, this moment truly is the first time I've had to consider it. And I think it works great. I think you can slot him in on the wing. He's a play finisher. He can go up for lobs. He can get out in transition. He can shoot wide open threes, which of course he's taken and making. I think that bolsters his three point percentage. And then defensively, he fits like a glove. That would be a home run pick in my mind. Home run pick. I, it would be so much fun if the Thunder drafted around Holland. Uh, Derek, I want to do two more players and then ask you our final question. This this subcategory is throw me a lifeline because I'm out on Yves Misi for the Thunder specifically, mm -hmm. not for the NBA in general. I think that will be a productive NBA player. But for the Thunder specifically, I see this just traditional rim runner who needs his guards to spoon feed him and the thunder do not have good passers in the live dribble pick and roll. So like, how are the thunder going to maximize him uh, and, and make him uh, and, and squeeze out all the value out of him? Uh, what is your thoughts on use me? See, a guy that you do like individually uh, when it comes to the thunder. Should I be drifted back into the boat? I'll, I'll do my best to, to pull you ashore. 610, 72 wingspan, 
not a shooter, but one of the most elite play finishers, again, like you said, in this draft. Here's the, the, the catch and the caveat. He started playing basketball, competitive basketball, four years ago. He just earned all Big 12 defensive team at 18, 19 years old, whatever he is. There is so, so much room for improvement. There's massive growth, room for massive growth. He's a completely blank canvas in terms of multiple players. He's bouncy, great target around the rim. He has the ability to pull the put the ball on the floor in space, which makes his upside to me pretty astronomical. It makes his fit with the Thunder better in that he's not necessarily a five-out player, but if he has space on the perimeter and can drive it, which as a big he's going to have in the Thunder system, that to me makes him a play. I don't know that I see him as a Thunder pick. I would be ecstatic if he was. He's one of my favorite players in this draft, but he is interesting in that. Again, I don't want to say he's Joel Embiid or anything like that, but he's got he's got some of the tendencies that Embiid had going into the league in terms of there's a lot of potential growth there. And, and I want to clarify that I do like him as an NBA player, but for the Thunder, I just don't see how they maximize him. Uh, I, I I like the idea of him putting the ball on the deck, and, and I love the clips of him doing it at Baylor. But in the NBA, when scouting reports are more important, when you're when you're you know targeting how to uh, pick your poison and and, and match up correct when you're facing Shea, Dub, and and Chet, he's a, he's an electric cutter. He's an electric driver with the ball in his hands. How do you do that whenever nobody's within ten feet of you? Like, how do you uh, maximize that skill set of yours whenever you're going to be just ignored on the perimeter and you're not going to have the guards? that treats you right, that, that, that gets you the ball in advantageous spots. Now, if Jadav and Shea took a step as a live ball, as live ball passers to, to set up their big men, this would be an awesome pick. Like this would be a great pick, but I'm not making a pick at 12 under the pretense of like, Hey, these two guys have to get a lot better for him to be good. I don't know. I just, I just don't see that, but you, you've, you've at least talked me into not just drowning. If the thunder do select them at 12, I would at the very least grab the life preserver and let you try to pull me into uh, into the deck. Uh, now, this next one, Tristan De Silva, is like everyone's thundery guy. But Derek, when I look at my big board, when I look at your big board, when I look at like just the, the options in this draft and the lack of consensus and, and like how much stuff's going to be able to be shifted around and moved around, there's just – no way that he's the most inspiring pick available at 12. Like to me, Tristan Da Silva is the definition of meh. And I just don't think that the Thunder should settle for meh at pick 12. Like how wrong am I? Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. I like Tristan Da Silva. I, I think there is a potential role in the NBA for him. But to, to your meh point, he is a jack of all trades, master of none. He has like no elite few skills to fall back on. Whereas like Misi's got the jump out of the gym athleticism. McCain is one of the most elite shooters in the class. Ron Holland has a little bit of everything, especially the defensive instincts. Da Silva is good to average at everything, but there's no elite, elite fallback skills. And to me, when in having him 27th or 28th, whatever I had him on my board, that's kind of what I look at. I think the NBA jump can just be so tough on guys who don't have really, really reliant skills. And I, I think sometimes that NBA jump just punches those guys in the face. And it's a little hard to adjust to how much more athletic everyone is, how much faster everyone is, how much better scoring, how much better you have to be on defense. Maybe he completely proves me wrong and he plugs in and he's immediately good like Jaime Jaquez. That was a player that I didn't, for the same reasons, I didn't know Jaime Jaquez was as elite a guy as he was at the jump shooting and he's great on defense. I had him low on my board and that, that was a miss for me. So maybe I haven't learned my lesson. Maybe De Silva is my, my killer this year, but I, I tend to agree with you in that he's definitely not the flashiest pick. Well, I'm glad we can agree. Here's the last question. The Thunder do not have a second round pick this year. Is there value in trading back into the second round and picking up another player as the Thunder head into the summertime without the four roster spots available at their disposal and at least one two-way spot open. Because, you know, sorry about it. Like, Olivier, sorry, it's a sad, tragic thing that you got hurt during the G League Finals. You're just, you're just not going to be able to use that spot on Olivier Sar because his, his Achilles, you know, of course, is shot. So uh, you're going to have a two-way spot open at minimum. Like, and, and that's before you discuss 
what to do with Keontae and Flagler. So you're going to have the two-way option. And there's a lot of just sicko names that I really like in this draft in the second round. Do you feel the same way? Would you trade into the second round? Would you trade into the first round again and just buy another first round pick? Like how aggressive would you be in this draft? Yeah, I think there's a decent chance I'm really good to even great players fall into the late first, second round of this draft. Again, in a draft that's as flat as this one, there's such a high likelihood that someone the Thunder have as a first round grade, maybe even 15 to 20 grade, is simply not on other teams' radars. I don't think it's out of the question they trade back in. I think my earlier point where players get pushed further and further back, that's going to keep happening. That's going to happen night one. That's going to happen night two. There's going to be really good players selected at 25, 30, 35, 40. We've seen it before in every draft. This draft especially magnifies that. So wouldn't shock me in the slightest if they're considering all their options and especially trading back into the late part of this draft. I'm excited to see how this all unfolds. I have a lot of second round darlings that I'll be uh, peppering you with in private, but maybe you'll grace us again with your presence to discuss them on the show. Derek, thank you so much for joining us. Where can they find you on Twitter and all of your work that you do? Yeah, Twitter, D Park OK, Rizzy Rise, Spot of Writing, Inside the Thunder, Draft Digest, YouTube at Derek Parker. Those are the spots. Those are the spots. Derek, thanks for joining us. And until next time, be good and be good to one another.